All right. Welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is Tuesday, day two of our virtual Watershed Congress week, and we are happy that you're joining us today. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Autumn and I am the Development Associate for the Delaware River Network, and I am also your moderator for this session, Social Change, the Positive Effects It Can Have on the Health of Our Communities. We are pleased to present Earl Wilson and Carolyn Mosley as our speakers for this session. A retired science teacher, Earl Wilson continues to devote his time to environmental organizations as president of the Eastwick Friends and Neighbors Coalition and as a board member of the Darby Creek Valley Association. With over 26 years experience as a project manager in housing development, Carolyn Mosley is a community advocate focused on building a vision of hope by educating residents about environmental injustice. Welcome to both Earl and Carolyn. I am now going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Autumn. Certainly appreciate the intro. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Earl Wilson, and I would like to thank all of you for your presence at today's 2021 Watershed Congress, sponsored by the Delaware Riverkeepers Network. Also, I would like to thank Delaware Riverkeepers Network for making it possible for me, the organization to which I belong, Eastwick Friends and Neighbors Coalition, and many other organ organizations to come together on one platform to bring to you, the very watershed communities, a wide range of topics to increase your environmental and organizational awareness. Today, my job will be to shine the proverbial spotlight on social change the positive effects it can have on our communities. I will attempt to draw a connection between you, the residents of the community in which you live, and factors within the community that can have a positive effect on you. I will use as an example, the Eastwick community to show the dynamic relationship as mentioned above. Residents of the Eastwick community have experienced many issues, especially environmental, that can have a negative effect on their overall health and welfare. They have been for decades complaining about air pollution from cars along the major highways, repetitive flooding, and a major landfill that's located on its western border. As we all know, the constant struggle to find solutions to the air pollution and flooding problems is an ongoing task for organizers. But finally, something is being done about the landfill. Residents and their organizations became ex extremely assertive and put enough pressure on city, state, and federal officials and convinced them to, quote, do something about the monstrous landfill. The Clearview Landfill, or Hell's Dump, as it's called, before the dumping of waste, trash, etc. was prohibited, covers 54 acres and at its highest point of elevation is approximately 10 stories tall. It sticks out in the community like a sore thumb and the residents wanted to get rid of it. After many years of complaints from the residents and organizations, the federal government finally declared the land for the Superfund site. The community came together especially after the landfill was declared a Superfund site, they co co the, their collective efforts resulted in increased confidence and in knowing that something could be done about one of the community's eyesore and possible health hazards. They were aware of and attended many meetings that resulted in the selection from seven other options of a possible solution to remediating the Clairview landfill. It was decided by federal, state, and community residents that the evapotranspiration or ET cover would be the best way to remediate that landfill. The ET cover is the process by which the top layer, uh, approximately two feet of toxic soil will be removed and replaced by two feet of toxic free soil. This process would cover the entire 54 acres of the landfill. 
All right, now, uh, for those of you who are visiting or at least uh, paying attention to this particular uh, uh, project, uh, the goal, of course, at this time is to increase environmental and organizational awareness and to shine a spotlight on social change. And then hopefully by doing these things, we can draw a connection between you and the facts within your communities that can have a positive effect on you. Next slide, please. All right, this is the major focus uh, of this particular project. And the reason why I am pointing uh, a spotlight on the landfill history is to show basically what the community can do uh, to affect in a sense, social change and to see the product of social change. When a community is extremely upset about what's happening in, a com in, in its community itself, they will at one point or another connect. And by doing so, they will realize just how important it is that the connections that they can put to the forefront, uh, what kind of uh, benefits it can bring in order to solve the problems that they are look, looking at or viewing at that particular time. Now let's look at this history here. Uh, for instance, this landfill was, was actually evolving from the back in the 50s and during that particular, from 50s to the 70s. And during that particular time, uh, residents in Eastwick have been fighting an, an upward battle, trying to get someone to do something about it. And that particular uh, fight, of course, was uh, effective later on. But however, we had to put enough pressure on the city, first of all, to allow them to stop uh, dumping in that particular area. Uh, in the mid 70s, uh, as you can see on the information in front of you, uh, the excavation, uh, filling a grading of Eastwick, the eastern portion of the landfill uh, for development. And I want you to look at that particular line grading portion of the landfill in for development of east of the Eastwick community. Now, what that is saying in a sense is the fact that portions of the landfill was actually scraped back toward where the major part of the landfill was. And in, in order to clear an area where houses can be built. Now, this is something that you, you're going to see a little later on and to see exactly what has happened with that particular move that was made in the mid 70s. Okay, now uh, later on and close to, to the year 2000, uh, the landfill itself was declared a super fun site. And uh, from that point on, and I don't need to read the rest of it, but from that point on, uh, we started working on trying to remediate uh, the landfill itself. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, the information in this particular slide tells us basically what has actually happened. Homes were built over toxic landfill materials. Homes were built over toxic landfill materials. No regard whatsoever about the residents who will purchase those homes and the effects that that toxic material will have on they and their families. But when the forensic study relative to the core process that EPA was doing around the perimeter of the landfill, they discovered that they, need to, they actually needed to go farther into the area away from the landfill. And that was when they actually found out that these homes were on top of toxic material and that residents were living in that particular area and over on top of the uh, land, the uh, toxic material for 10, 15, 20 years or more. And at the same time, and the last bullet point for this particular slide, the residents 
knew at that point in time, even though there were no uh, ways to actually prove their point, but they were complaining about suffering life-threatening uh, illnesses. Uh, and, and we think that it was probably due to the toxicity of the soil in which they were living on. Let's move to the next slide, please. All right, now. Okay. Uh, this, this slide backs up exactly what was mentioned to you just a few seconds ago. Uh, here we have the actual clearing of the toxic material and at the same time covering those areas that have been cleared with toxic free soil. Now the main point of interest for this particular slide, and you probably see one or two more later on, is and I want you to look at the actual background and look at the homes back there and also the the, 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 the fence, the uniformity of fencing. Those fencing basically is an indication of the fact that the EPA had to go into the backyards, clean up the toxic material that was in the backyard and replace the fencing that you're looking at at this point in time. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's it, it's a massive job. And, and look at the way in which, look at the activity and, and the proximity of the activity of the landfill to the homes uh, of the residents of Eastwick. Okay, all right, let's move to the next slide, please. All right, now this is where the social um, situation comes into play. We want to make sure that um, that there is an understanding that at this point in time and within the last 10 years or more, residents uh, begin to really feel the urgency of the work that they needed to do and uh, to actually uh, put together the kind of fight for them to make sure that this particular situation has been straightened out. Uh, you have a uh, a, a, a briefing on exactly what that particular landfill is all about. And that second bullet point spells out the size of uh, the landfill itself. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Now, we are now looking at, in red, I think that's red, is that that looks like red, okay. Uh, ET, that, that area. That's where the work is being done at this point in time. However, you look at the, um, the creek, someone put a pretty good drawing of the way in which the creek was actually meandering uh, in and around the uh, area uh, by way of Eastwick on one side of it, on the right side and Delaware County basically on the other side, okay? Uh, now, this is a part of the, this, is, this situation occurred during the um, East, East flooding. This is just the beginning of it because the flooding situation was a little bit more than, than what you're looking at here, okay? And, uh, but the key to this particular area is the fact that when the flooding occurred, EPA was extremely nervous about the fact that uh, the flooding would perhaps inundate the area and also bring into where the new ET cover was additional toxic material. They did test that when once the flood had subsided, EPA did test it. And from what I understand, they were actually um, uh, safe and knowing that um, that no toxic material was was in that particular area it was actually brought in by the flooding itself. Okay, uh, let's let's look at the next slide. 
Uh, now, this this remediation process is twofold. One, uh, I want you to look at the trees on the right side of the creek. Okay, and the reason why I'm mentioning that is because I want you to know that this is basically the way the landfill appeared before the actual remediation process came into play. On the left side is some of the work that was done at the base of the landfill. And uh, I, I want you to think in terms of, you see the structure lining the creek bed, that look like rows of logs. Well, that is what's called a crib wall. And in one of the slides that I have later on, you will be able to see exactly, you know, how that particular crib wall is put in place. Uh, but the reason behind it, the objective behind the crib wall is to eliminate further erosion, especially during the tidal activities that come into the, the Cobbs Creek. Uh, hopefully that will solve the problem and maybe perhaps keep additional toxic material, and you'll see what I'm talking about later, but keep additional toxic material from, from being eroded into the creek itself. Okay, uh, let's move to the next slide. All right, now, this is a what you're looking at at this time is a cross section of a lower portion of the um, landfill itself. Now you can imagine if this is around the area of about five to 10 feet, you can imagine what's in that, <clears throat> that um, a landfill, uh, especially when it reaches a height of about 10 stories. And this is one of the famous reason why we accepted the ET cover uh, rather than trying to haul away uh, a lot of the, the, the materials at that landfill. The process behind that, as was explained to the residents, was the fact that uh, by doing so, uh, we would have to open up the landfill to additional toxic material and probably uh, material that's airborne and it would create additional problems for the community itself. So rather than moving the entire, and, and of course, you know, where are you gonna put all of that material? 54 acres at 10 stories tall, where are you gonna put it? So they, we decided to use the uh, ET cover, uh, which has been explained before. Okay, let's move to the next slide, please. Okay, again, now, this is a better shot of the actual uh, remediation where the, the, the tractor all the way in the back on the left side uh, is actually spreading the uh, toxic free material. What you're looking at in the foreground is a level area that has uh, toxic material that is yet to be covered. Uh, it is extremely important that, um, that we be aware of that and to know that um, at least two feet of toxic free soil will definitely be uh, 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 pushed over that particular area that we're looking at. Next slide. Oh, and this is, <clears throat> this is uh, a one that shows basically the ET cover in place, new plants have been uh, planted, different types of plants have been planted uh, in order to replace uh, the foliage or plants that was actually a part of the landfill prior to them excavating it. They had to remove the older trees and what have you in order to have a clear, clean sweep of the toxic soil that was in the area. Uh, and by doing so, they knew that at one point or another, they would have to uh, replant a lot of fast growing uh, trees and shrubs with extensive root systems, okay? 
Now, what you're looking at in the foreground is the first stage of the planning. In the background of the slide, you'll see the, the white stakes. Each one of those stakes represents a small sapling that is continuing to grow. And they put them in the stakes, in the uh, tubings, in order to protect them from animals, et cetera. Uh, and it will it be allowed to grow just like the ones that you're looking at right now. These are plants growing out of the white tubings. Those tubings are still on there. And, uh, and, and they'll be allowed to grow to a point where uh, the EPA um, workers will eventually be able to strip them off, uh, thinking, of course, that uh, it, they'll be strong enough and big enough to stand on their own. All right, next slide, please. These are a good example. And you, you're looking at a comparison between the plants that are actually being rooted uh, in buckets. Uh, I would call them buckets. And you can see they're half full of water and the different types of species of plants uh, that will be eventually uh, used to fill in for or to cover uh, the rest of the uh, landfill itself. Uh, one of the species that I know of is the poplar tree. And uh, one of the, the, character, the characteristics of the poplar tree is the fact that it is fast growing. It has a root system that, that, is, that absorbs a lot of water. And uh, that and other species with similar characteristics uh, is going to be used in order to cover the landfill uh, because by absorbing so much of the water, <clears throat> it, it keeps the water from going down into the ET cover. That in turn slows down the process by which gravity is pulling on the toxic material and taking the toxic material toward underground and toward the aquifers and the water table. It is extremely important for that process to be uh, uh, stopped uh, and so that um, the EPA can continue its work on, uh, on uh, remediating the, the, the toxic stuff itself. Next slide, please. There, there you go. Remember earlier I mentioned the crib wall? This is a good example of exactly what that crib wall looks like when it is actually being installed. Uh, the, the tree trunks that you're looking at, I believe the tree trunks are actually cedar. And cedar trees are trees that are known for its ability to resist rotting over a period of time. Uh, and um, that's what that particular crib wall is, 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 is uh, being constructed of. Cedar and of course, you know, the the stones that you see in the background to allow for water to be able to uh, flow in behind it all. It, it, it presents a porous surface. Uh, and hopefully, you know, that particular situation is, is going to be successful as well. Um, now let's go to the parting thoughts. <clears throat> okay. The collective confidence building activism has brought some changes to the community, at least for this major issue. Hopefully this type of energy will evolve and become significant in dealing with other issues of concern in the community itself. Uh, I'm hoping that um, <clears throat> the comparative bit of information and the thought of the fact that the community was extremely involved in what is going on there is an answer to the um, social change, the positive effects uh, it can have on our community. There can be no social change if, for instance, people do not get involved. And that's, and that's basically what is happening here. They're using the uh, landfill, 
was a, a, a good way of showing how a collective effort on the parts of uh, community people, were a, they were able to get this thing down. We're talking about $25, $30 million or more at this point in time. And, and we're hoping that it's going to be successful and that we can repurpose that landfill for parks, recreation, things of that nature. Um, at this time, I just would like to thank you guys, everybody, for allowing me to speak to you regarding the above. Uh, I can only hope that I've encouraged you to take up the banner of advocacy and to make the significant changes that will have a positive effect on your community. Thank you very much. My name is Carolyn Mosley and I'm with Eastwick United, another th uh, major uh, organization here in the Eastwick community. Uh, actually, it's Eastwick United Community Development Corporation. And I'd like to have a discussion using Eastwick as, as an example to illustrate the necessity for social change and how it can be a pathway to environmental justice. Let's begin by defining what is social change. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, from a sociological perspective, social change is the alteration of mechanisms within the social structure, characterized by changes in cultural symbols, rules of behavior, social organizations, or value systems. Wikipedia def defines social change as it involving the alteration of social order of a society. It may include changes in social institution, social behaviors, or social relations. So I think it's fair to say that both Britannica and Wikipedia are in agreement in terms of what social change is. Let's look at environmental injustice and its impacts. Environmental injustice can be a contradiction of policies laws or behaviors that produce unequal distribution of benefits and burdens, which then translates into the diminution of one's ability to enjoy an environment that promotes emotional, mental, and physical well-being, which is something that we all have a right to. I'd like to take you on a little tour of Eastwick. If you were to come to our community, here's what you would see. A typical street landscape, garden style, two-story homes, middle class, a neighborhood, primarily African-American community, quiet tree-lined streets with manicured lawns. These houses were construct constructed anywhere from the late 60s through the mid 1970s. So Eastwick today, there are so many wonderful attributes that are here in Eastwick that I'd like to share with you. We have open green space. We have an urban refuge right in our very own backyards. We are accessible to every major roadway coming in and out of Philadelphia. 95, 476, 291, 676, all the bridges. And what's even more appealing is that we are a transportation hub. We can be anywhere or we can get downtown or anywhere else in the city in a matter of minutes by just about every mode of transportation there is. We can even go anywhere in the world with just a, a less than one mile ride to Philadelphia International Airport. Appealing, you say? Eastwick is a community of contradictions. Those attributes, natural and man-made, that might seem to be a blessing, are also our curses. Here's a beautiful little creek. The benefit, the burden, it causes catastrophic, catastrophic flooding. And that photo was taken from Hurricane Floyd. While we are at, well, we have access to major 
modes of transportation and accessibility to major roadways, the carbon footprint from and the amount of greenhouse gases producing carbon dioxide and methane are overwhelming. Research has shown that communities of color often bear the brunt of adverse environmental impacts through the placement of toxic producing industries, the absence of necessary goods and services needed for sustainability. Here's an example of the unequal distribution. In those communities of color, you often find food deserts and or industries, the burden of industries that cause or, or that produce those carbon, th those environmental hazards. This is a statistic that was taken from the city of Chester, which is only 12 minutes from Eastwick, as well as a community of color. So how do we achieve social justice? Let's look at some of the ways. We need to restart our history so that we can avoid making the mistakes as we move forward to achieve so, uh, of the justice and social change. Environmental justice is not new and it doesn't always happen by mistake. It has been occurring for centuries. While the methods of the discriminatory practices have changed, the results are still the same. Then we need to learn from our past. Over the years, the implementation of laws and policy to legitimize environmental racism has played a significant role in placing environmental burdens on communities of color or eliminating those communities altogether. We then need to examine the evolution of public policy and its impact. According to the Urban Land Institute, urban renewal is a term used in the 1950s through the 1970s, referring to a process by which an urban neighborhood is redeveloped or rehabilitated. However, urban renewal was often used to justify the rising of entire neighborhoods for the common good. And the residents of those neighborhoods, often people of color, were forced to move elsewhere. Eastwick is one of those communities. And lastly, we have to have difficult but necessary conversations so that we can fully understand the impact of environmental injustice and achieve true social justice. And having said that, I would like to leave you with a clip, video clip, very brief video clip, that was shared with me about three months ago, a historical uh, perspective on racism and the impacts of the environment and how it was used to destroy communities of color largely communities of color. And this practically curled my hair. So I'd like for you to take a look at this because this is probably one of the best kept secrets you will ever learn. That concludes our presentation and um, we're well open to taking any questions. At Without this a doubt. All right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we have a few questions. Um, first of all, Earl, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the EPA's recognition of the Eastwick Lower Darby Creek Area Community Advisory Group this summer? I believe they've recognized yeah. them with an award. Yeah, I, I, as a matter of fact, oh, I didn't even know that you were aware of that. Yes, as a matter of fact, um, and, and this is what social change is all about. It allows for people, I, I think that phrase so, social change is really wrapped around the involvement and advocacy of people in the community. And um, when we begin to do some real serious work at that landfill, there was a community advisory group that was formed and that group, of course, was working almost like shoulder to shoulder with EPA, uh, the project manager, and the EPA team. Uh, we had access to, uh, through by way of a government grant called a technical, 
technical assistance grant, we were able to get a company uh, that was uh, experienced in landfill operations, but was working on behalf of uh, the, the, the residents of Eastwick. And that was a very good combination because it, it, over the five or six years, uh, we never, we had numbers of meetings, uh, sometimes two major meetings per month. Uh, and uh, we were able to see this whole project through uh, to the point where uh, several months ago, EPA decided that of all of the um, CAG representations that it has in the country, that because of the cooperation that uh, the Eastwick, Lower Derby, Creek area CAG was able to give them and the stick-to-itiveness from this particular community, uh, I th thought it was in EPA's uh, uh, purview to present a, um, an award to Uh, and uh, I just was able to move around to get it. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but this is this is this is what it looks like. And all the CAG members received this award. We were the only CAG group in the country to receive this award, which is labeled as. Uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency National Notable Achievement Award of uh, 2021. Congratulations. Um, Carolyn, Thank you. I see you have a hand raised. Did you have something you wanted to add or, no, or mention? Oh, you know what? I think that that may have been by accident. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the plan to fill Eastwick with coal silt um, in order to build the new community? I believe this was a redevelopment plan from back in the late 1940s. Yeah, and, and as a matter of fact, um, the homes, especially the newly built ones, were actually built on landfill. And that landfill material basically came from Upper School Kill River uh, as, as slag material coming from the mines. And I think this is the reason why some of the neighbors have complained about the fact that these homes are still settling at this point in time because the slag material is not the kind of material that you would like to put a foundation on. Uh, I can remember walking through and watching some of the homes being built uh, but before they could actually put lay down the actual concrete foundation, they had to drive uh, what's called utility poles, similar to the ones that you see on the street, uh, into the ground at, at least about three or four feet apart in order to stabilize the soil underneath the homes before they could actually put the actual uh, concrete uh, foundation down. Uh, so that's basically, you know, what happened with that particular slag. As uh, one of the, one of the um, um, Delaware River Keepers um, uh, Watershed Congress in Pottstown, uh, we had a speaker who actually was very knowledgeable in the way in which that slag material came down the river and and was actually brought into the the uh, Eastwick community to fill in what was at that time a tremendous amount of wetland and try to make those properties uh, strong enough so that uh, homes can be built. Carolyn, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, uh, other than, than the first section of the homes that were built here in Eastwick are sinking because they were built on silk. Mm which even at the time those homes were constructed, city code specifically stated that silt was not a suitable foundation. That's right. For those homes. Some of the homes, and these are along Lindbergh Boulevard uh, between 68th and 
70th Street, and then going back several blocks deep. Some of these homes, the only thing that's supporting these homes are each other. The that's homes right. are sort of leaning together. We have a lot of seniors in those properties. Um, you know, some people have just abandoned and walked away from their homes because repairs to the homes just got so exorbitantly costly. So it is a, it's a real problem, you know, for those folks. Mm -hmm. All right, we uh, have. And, and I, I can add that um, we had an opportunity at one time to look at some of those sinking homes that Carolyn is talking about. And it was, it, it was appalling to look up underneath the actual original concrete foundation and see that the soil, that same slag and silt that Carolyn was talking about, had actually fallen down based on resettling at least two to three feet below the actual concrete that, that was supposed to be the foundation of the home. This is what these people are up against at this point. So this actually segs into some of the questions from our attendees. Uh, so have the responsible parties ever be he been held accountable for dumping toxic waste in the community? Um, has there any, been any repercussion for the health hazards that have resulted? Uh, and, and in particular, um, why was there, I guess, a big gap between 1950 and the 1990s in terms of action being taken? Mm -hmm. to, to answer your question, um, the long, the short answer of your question is no. That's right. There's been no accountability because there's been no one to really accept or who will accept the responsibility. Keep in mind when the dumping, the dumping initially started, this was before EPA. It was not only, you know, th there were hospitals that were dumping. There were a number yeah, of organizations that were coming and dumping on that site. Mm -hmm. And according to the laws, you have to be very, very specific about who it is that dump, what they dump. So at that point, as you, the, the, you know, by the time this development got built, it was very difficult to go back and trace and actually prove who did it. Now, that's that's on the dumping issue. Let's talk about the construction issue of these homes. Does, is, does the city and the contractor both clearly bear the responsibility? But when taken to task, the answer was, sorry, warranties are out. Mm -hmm. and, and the expiration of, you know, the time to bring a lawsuit has ended. City has no money. What do you want us to do? However, it, it's, it's not forgotten. It is an injustice. Yeah, absolutely. And we are looking at ways of addressing that injustice and holding those accountable who need to be held accountable. And, it, and it's not over. It's not over. And on the, on the, on the uh, uh, respiratory disease side of things, um, we have had a uh, representative from uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who are experts in, in uh, biological problems and things of that nature. Uh, and um, we have not been able to access uh, specific information that can shine a spotlight on the actual culprit that have actually been uh, responsible for uh, the um, toxic material that was dumped, and uh, I, I can say this, I think the city is just as responsible as any of the other um, uh, entity that you can probably think about at this point in time. Uh, but it's it, like Carolyn said, it's an ongoing situation at this time. We're not going to give up on it. We are definitely not going to give up on it because it was wrong. Uh, it was definitely the epitome of an injustice and someone will have to pay the price, uh, even if it means, of course, uh, doing justice for the, the residents who are living in these conditions and who have been harmed by it. Well, thank you. We are just about a, out of time. Um, just a quick request for the future so that we can share with our watchers. Um, 
We have been asked if you could supply uh, any sort of information on actions that they could take uh, to assist and support the Eastwick neighbors, um, as well as any sort of reference material that they might learn more about the um, development displacement lakes. Um, so if you could share that with us at some point or in the chat, we can go ahead and pass that information on. Um, there's definitely a lot of interest and I wish you the very best of luck with your ongoing endeavors. Uh, amazing work. But as I said, I am afraid it is about time to wrap up our session. And I wanted to thank our speakers once again for taking the time to share their knowledge and expertise with us during this week of Watershed Congress presentations. And thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it all.